Okay. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is uh, Travis Norman. He is a, a PhD student at uh, West Virginia University. Uh, Jim Thompson's his uh, advisor, and uh, his uh, topic, his uh, <clears throat> talk topic is Red Spruce Soil Storybook. Okay, right. and uh, Travis is going to take it away and. Uh, Okay. He's going to he's going to provide some background on his uh, his uh, professional uh, career here. Um, so, without further ado, Travis. So, hello to everybody out there online. Um, like Dave said, my name is Travis Nauman. Um We're kind of trying to get back everybody back from lunch here in uh, Canaan Valley. So um, just kind of probably stall for a minute or two here. But uh, so my background is I'm a so I'm a PhD student working in, uh, in a soil science degree. And um, I'm kind of a transplant from the West Coast uh, where I was working on ecological site correlation to soil, um, soil map units on uh, one of the ongoing soil mapping projects in Arizona. And so I kind of transplanted here to uh, to, work, to do work on this project that um, we're presenting today, looking at um, kind of the connections between historic distribution of red spruce and um, the soils and some of these new uh, soils that <clears throat> and new soil properties that we're kind of rediscovering. If you were here for Skip Bell's presentation, um, we're tuned in this morning. Um, and so we'll uh, we'll jump into this. Um, though we're kind of waiting for folks, um, but uh, we're having a technical screen we're Working on some technical issues here, but um, I kind of I retitled my my presentation um, to the the Red Spruce Soil Storybook uh, from what I had it at because. One of the reasons I got into soil science was that um, soil tells a story of, of, uh, of the history and environment at a site. And um, if you know what to look for in a soil, that you can you can start to glance back in history and, and see what uh, what's taking place in the past at that site. And so um, it's part of what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation um, as we get things rolling here. And um, uh, and move forward. Uh, so kind of some of the objectives um, that we're trying to figure out um, with the work that, that I've been doing here is how we can use soil properties to try and help us um, figure out what the um, pre-colonial, pre-European disturbance of uh, these uh, high elevation red spruce um, communities in, in West Virginia and kind of the higher part of the central Appalachians. And uh, we're trying to use uh, spatial models of these properties to help us kind of aid in, in planning restoration. Um, and so we we'll also have some questions about how these forest changes have overall affected soil properties from then to now and impact the ecological dynamics like sensitive habitat niches for Chief Mountain Salamander, Northern Flying Squirrel. Um, it's kind of a work in progress. Um, so some of our hypotheses. Um, I'm going to take a, a quick pause here and try and figure out some technical issues. Apologize to the folks online.
To be all you folks online, we we'll keep on going here. And, uh, so, so to, to kind of start up again. So, what we, what are some of our hypotheses are that some of the aluminum and iron um, spodic soil properties that we're finding in, in the soils um, in these areas in West Virginia um, likely reflect the kind of greater conifer extent that used to exist uh, in these landscapes before um, basically the whole area was harvested pretty intensely from the 1860s to the 1920s. And that there, uh, this is pretty well documented, there are a lot of areas that are now hardwood that used to be, uh, have a lot more conifer influence, and that uh, the disturbance associated um, back in the day was, uh, has shifted a lot of the community states to more hardwood dominance. Um, and that in a lot of those areas that, that have lost conifer, we also lost a, lost a lot of forest floor material, um, also known as moors and overhorizons. So this, this represents potentially a large flux of carbon out of the system and uh, into the atmosphere, likely, which has implications you know, for, for larger issues like climate change or whatnot. Um, but there's a lot of literature around... around uh, sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. Um, that that kind of documents how when you transition from a conifer to hardwood forest, you also have uh, pretty quick shifts in your forest floor type. Um, so we've seen some new data um, in past presentations that kind of reconfirms the a greater prevalence of spodic properties than some of the current soil map products that are out there in these areas, which also kind of supports that there used to be a greater uh, influence of conifer. Um, and so one of the other things that we think we can do is employ some digital soil mapping methods, which kind of draw on classic soil science and the state factor model to be able to spatially model these areas um, from the soil. Um, so what I'm going to try and show you today is um, first I want to show you some of our um, results doing spatial models and mapping these photic soil properties. So how that corresponds to the witness tree database, which is kind of a glance back in history through some um, old property survey data that's been published on recently. And then I'll talk about how soils kind of tell the story, how we can use soil science to kind of support that story. Um, then I'm going to visit some more details about how we do that, um, the spatial models of these soil properties. And then talk about some new lab data that we have that connects photic soil properties, some climo topographic niches, and forest composition changes, and then kind of have some brief conclusions about some of the ecological implications of that. So the study data <clears throat> that we're using, um, we've, in the last, in the last few years, and this, these were, a lot of this data was shown this morning, there have been um, about 330 new field soil descriptions um, in this kind of area of West Virginia along the Virginia border. And last summer, we also collected new um, plot data at kind of all the red points you see here. Um, so there's 63 new veg plots that we did, so fixed area forest plots where we um, fully described soil patterns and sampled, um, sampled horizons to do laboratory descriptions. Um, and so I'll kind of be discussing some analysis we've done with both of these data sets um, and um, trying to tell the story from the soil's perspective of how these forests have changed over time. 
So just to give you a visual of kind of the grading of upland soils and forest communities, on the left we have more of a hardwood dominated site where um, you kind of have a pretty generic profile. And when we go to the right, you see a, a more conifer dominated site. We have really well expressed spotting morphology where you see a, a big bleached E horizon under an O horizon that's pretty deep. And then you have a subsurface accumulation of iron oxides and aluminum oxides, which is kind of typical of a, a spodosol. And then we have a kind of an integrate in the middle where we might kind of see um, see some of that spodic development. Um, one second. Getting the cursor up here, so I'm pointing things out to you guys online. Um, it's where we can kind of see a little bit of hints of the knee horizon, and we see the reddening you can see here in this middle pro profile, and we think that's kind of integrated. There's a gradient of these sites where you have, on the right, you have much more conical influence, and you go into the left, you have hardwood influence. And so what I've tried, what I've tried to do is model basically anything on this right side. So anything that has any um, hint of spodic soil properties, model that spatially. And so what I'm showing you here is a map of the of a probability-based map where you have green areas have higher probabilities of spodic soil um, morphology, and the brown areas have low probability of spodic soil morphology. And overlaying that map, we have um, witness tree data points, so that kind of um, historic historic uh, glimpse into what the forest used to look like. As you can see on the right, we we used a couple different ways to try and validate the spatial model. And we were able to basically say that this is about 70 to 88 percent accurate uh, based on, on these three different um, ways that we uh, validated this map. Uh, and so then we, we tested that, um, that probability map of spodic soil morphology against the witness tree database. He's basically saying we want to look at points that um, where spruce or hemlock were present versus points where spruce or hemlock were not present. And basically what we were able to say is that we had a, um, a pretty significant statistic difference that um, basically our higher probabilities corresponded to spruce and hemlock sites. So basically what we can say is that spodic soil properties that we're seeing today spatially correspond to the witness tree data that was collected before things were harvested. So that's a, that's a strong cross-disciplinary evidence saying that linking kind of this hypothesis that we have about spodic soil properties representing, or spodic soil properties representing the past forest composition. And so now looking at kind of those model probabilities on the y-axis here on this, on this graph, and then um, this, this field spodic intensity that we described in the field at all these points on the x-axis. So basically, zero is no evidence of positivization. And if we go right of that, right of this red line, we have evidence. We have there was observed spodic morphology in soil profiles. And so what we wanted to see, and these are some some of the plots that I collected last summer, um, is that to the right here we expect to see higher probabilities. Which in this um, in this graph we can see that things things separate pretty well. And that what we can do with looking at this graph is also symbolize what the overstory vegetation at all these plots were and see if that makes sense. So we see mostly when we go to that far upper right corner where we have high probabilities of spodic, morph spodic morphology and indeed we had we actually observed, observed spodic morphology in the field. We had kind of some of the, some of the conifer sites that, uh, that we'd expect to see. So basically, this this uh, this graph kind of helps us see how we can group ecological sites as well. Um, and if you were tuned into Jason Keith's presentation, uh, you see that over here in the upper right, <clears throat> kind of outlined in this blue, is what I would kind of outline roughly as, as sites that would probably fall into that spodic shale upland conifer forest. And if we move kind of the center swath, um, where we kind of have <clears throat> more hardwood and mixed um, communities right now we have a spodic integrate, um, and that's that kind of mixed forest site. And then if we look in this bottom left corner, so we have lower probabilities from that spatial model, 
that I showed you in a prior slide, uh, we have a kind of a, a hardwood site that's, uh, and, then we, and we see that kind of in the low probabilities of sphotic morphology expression and in basically all hardwood sites that fell into that corner. So we're able to separate out kind of the ecological dynamics and the soil uh, and the associated soils. And so this is just the um, sphotic intensity um, index that Tim Dillplein and other folks in the West Virginia NRCS kind of used to, to kind of objectively rate this. And basically what I was trying to model is anything that wasn't a rating of zero. Um, and so most of these, these are kind of long statements, but it's all kind of based on the expression of the E horizon and the reddening of the, of the B horizons. Um, and so this is just looking at that same Spodic Cheryl Uplands ecological site state and transition model that, that Jason showed earlier. And so <clears throat> what we think has happened at a lot of these sites is that there's this reference state that um, where you, in sites where we have well-pronounced Spodic morphology, that's a red spruce eastern hemlock forest, and then if you have different types of logging and, and burning uh, disturbance, you can push it in these other states which are either have regenerated in hardwood, different hardwood combinations, or have been planted. And there's restoration pathways we can we can uh, employ to try and get back to that reference state. And so I kind of wanted to step back and go over some some more kind of basic soil science to talk about how how soils tell this story. So how do we so what's the logic really connecting um, spotting morphology and conifer forests. And um, so we go back to kind of some of the foundations of soil science. We look at the factorial equation where soils are kind of related to the climate and organisms, relief, parent material, or the geologic substrate that the soils form in, and, and then time, how long have those, how long have, um, have those sediments been there and had these forces acting on them. So this is just kind of a diagram showing some of the different examples of those where we have precip and temperature for climate drivers. We have flora fauna for organisms. And so this, this body of literature kind of evolved over time into more of an ecological factorial where you have a bunch of ecosystems, soil, vegetation, animal properties that are, that are become a function of some set of initial conditions and then drivers so that energy inputs into the system that usually um, the dominant ones are related to climate and organisms. <clears throat> and so what does that do to the soils? Well, factors drive processes in the soil. And so at kind of a, a simplest explanation of that, we have additions, removals, translocations, and transformations in the soil. So you have, if you have more rain, you're going to have more water moving through a soil profile, and more power to leach things or move things through profile. More, uh, more ability to, to weather minerals and, and have transformations within that profile. And so, and other folks have tried to take that even farther and start quantifying the energy of different drivers within a soil. And so, um, one of the kind of better known papers is by Runge where he mainly points out organic matter inputs and water as some of the energy drivers in, um, in, in soil processes. And so, in any soil, you, you really have a set of processes going on at any one time. Soils are complex. And so, so soils basically are evolving based on kind of a balance of processes going on in that profile at any given time. And this balance can change over time. And so based on what, it, on what, what, uh, what those balance of processes are, you can either have a set of, uh, a set of uh, things going on that will progress the soil into having more defined horizons or it can, or it can take it backwards to say if you, have, if you have a wet climate regime going for, for a couple thousand years and then it changes and you're in a dry climate regime, um, things can kind of shift another direction. And so often we have superimposed sets of soil properties that result from different, um, from different sets of processes going on over time. And this is an example actually from um, the Upper Greenbrier watershed where I think there's Two sets of um, two two leaching fronts going on. I think this you see this lighter horizon here that I'm highlighting. I think is a kind of a relic E horizon from before um, from before the logging during around 1900. And then this site, um, this is actually what what uh, what I think is actually a red spruce plantation site um, was harvested 
burned and is replanted. It's a pretty young stand. You've had new overrising development. And along below that overrising, we have a thick charcoal layer that kind of is evidence of that burning. And then we have kind of a new e-horizon coming in, real thin here, and then a new translocation of, of materials below it. And then we move into the old e-horizon. So this is what's called a bisequel soil um, in, uh, in, in soil science lingo. And so, and so within soil evolution, we have dominant pathways. So when you have a set of processes kind of lined up and stable for a while, um, you can have different uh, dominant pathways. And fossilization, which is, is a dominant pathway that creates photic soil properties and spotosols. And so this has already been kind of discussed in, uh, quite well by, by Skip Bell earlier, but kind of some of the environmental things that are necessary for this pathway to move forward is you need acidic uh, permeable substrate that, uh, and um, acidic nutrient-poor organic inputs. And, and you need enough moisture to leach aluminum, iron, and organic carbon through the profile. And this, this like I said, this happens mostly in cool, moist climates. And so on the right here, we see a, an extremely well, extremely strong example of podzolization um, up on the top of Cheat Mountain in one of the profiles we excavated last summer. And so photosol morphology, this has also been um, kind of covered in prior Presentations just briefly. Um, usually get a uh, pretty pretty thick O horizon, and below that a leached out E horizon. Then you get accumulation of organic matter right below the E horizon, and then you have a horizon, a BHS horizon, where you have both organic matter and and accessory oxides or aluminum and iron hydroxide complexes, and then you move down in the BS horizon, which is just has an accumulation of um, aluminum and iron hydroxides. And if you look at these soil horizon boundaries, you'll, you'll note that soils are pretty complex. Soil horizons or layers don't always just line up horizontally. <clears throat> and so we have to be careful how we try and model them or look at them, um, because they've been documented to have kind of somewhat unstable or chaotic um, behaviors, especially when you're, when you're talking about how water moves through a soil. Water moves in weird ways through the soil and um, based on you know, micromorphology, and so sometimes things don't, as far as the depth profile, looking at how horizons are distributed over depth, they can, you can become pretty complex. And, and this goes at, at multiple scales. You go out to a regional scale or you go to a micro scale. Um, people have kind of compared them to, to fractals, and there's a lot of literature about kind of the hierarchical nature of soils. And um, that's part of the reason why um, employed, uh, kind of tended to favor using tree-based models in that, in that first, um, that first spatial um, model that I showed you is, a, is based on a random forest algorithm, which, which utilizes tree-based modeling. Um, and so one thing that I've been trying to do is separate uh, process from kind of the chaotic depth variation that we see in soil horizons, because a lot of the spatial modeling is has been based on modeling a soil property at a specific depth, which becomes really hard because that you're talking about a lot of a lot of variation you're trying to account for in a, in a when you're mapping soils. <clears throat> and so we're kind of further talking about kind of different parts of the positivization process that we might try and isolate uh, when we're modeling and trying to relate it to the environment. So we have O horizon buildup, which is a pretty dynamic process. This is something that can shift pretty quickly with, with vegetation. Uh, we also have organic matter built up in the subsoil. Again, that's a pretty dynamic process. It happens on a short time frame. It can, it can respond, that will respond quickly to vegetation changes. But then we get to iron and aluminum build up in the subsoil. And these are a bit more recalcitrant. So this, these tend to stick around in the soil if you shift vegetation types, and especially aluminum. Um, because iron is a transition metal, and it can it can serve as an electron receptor in, uh, when you have anaerobic conditions. So it has it has multiple mechanisms that can mobilize it into a soluble state. But aluminum is relatively the the aluminum translocation you see in spotosols is a relatively um, specific process to positivization, and that's why when when Skip was defining it, taxonomy is you have to have aluminum translocation in order to have a spotosol or a spotosol. 
it's it's part of the definition. Iron, yes or no. Um, and so part of what I think is aluminum is the key to, to really figuring out um, kind of the past as far as using spodic soil properties. And so kind of similar to some of the graphs um, Skip showed you earlier, this is a depth profile of aluminum and iron concentrations. And on the left is a spud distra depth, so you can see um, kind of this um, orange area is kind of what I would call the translocation peak of, uh, of aluminum. And then over here on the right, we see a more pronounced one and a, and a, full, a fully blown spot cell profile. And you can kind of see that the, the iron doesn't necessarily agree with, um, at least in these two profiles, with what's going on with the aluminum. And so I kind of feel like aluminum is probably our best bet for looking at kind of long-term uh, glimpse into the past with as far as positivization is concerned. Um, and so when you, dig, when you dig kind of deeper into the literature, there's been a lot um, done in kind of similar environments in Europe and in Scandinavia and in uh, kind of the Great Lakes region about what happens when you switch back and forth between conifer and hardwood. And a lot of what you see is quick responses, like I was mentioning, of the overhorizon. You'll lose, you'll lose the deeper, more overhorizons and you transition to a mole or a modder, which is um, forest floor, which doesn't have that organic buildup um, at the, the surface. It's more of an A horizon, um, so a mineral horizon with some organic enrichment. Um, but again, I want to highlight the once once you have positivization, the aluminum and iron are going to stick around for a long time, and um, and in in some cases of uh, in the literature they'll say that that'll stick around for 250,000 years. So um, that's kind of the recalcitrant tracer that we might be looking for to, to more specifically glimpse in the in the past. And so. When we look at forest composition effects on um, on the um, on soils, we kind of have this gradient between acidifiers and more base cyclers. And so we kind of maple and birch are kind of on the right side of that, beech and oak are somewhere in the middle, and then we get to conifer, hemlock, pine on the left, and we kind of see this gradient of soils that um, kind of would be associated with those in similar forest systems to what we're looking at. And this is from looking at a pretty broad range of literature. Um, and so we know that within decades to a century, forest floor, E horizon, pH, and our overall process pathway can shift. But those aluminum and iron tracers are going to stick around if we've had fossilization. So going back to how we made that original map that I showed you in the beginning of the probability of spodic morphology. So now we know a little bit about the, about the environmental drivers that, that, that affect soil process and process that can um, can show, can, can cause positivization in spodic soil properties to, to develop. Um, so now how do, we, how do we model that? And here I have this big long list. Every one of these rows is a, is a map of, of some kind of uh, property um, of the landscape and the environment. And so all of these kind of green, um, blue variables uh, at the top are from the National Elevation data sets so we're looking at effects of aspects, uh, different different metrics of the curvature of the landscape or how far up and down hill slope you are. And then we also use Landsat GeoCover, which is a highly processed um, product um, looking at looking at Landsat. And so we wanted to see if um, we could use any of the current vegetation signatures in that to help us model, um, model stuff spatially. And so now we look back at that uh, kind of a zoom in of that spodic intensity model again with the kind of green-blue stuff being high probabilities of, of spodic morphology and the brown being lower probabilities of spodic morphology. And so this, uh, especially for the folks in the room, this is um, Burner Mountain. And so i try and trace the ridgeline for you here uh, if I can. So Burner Mountain is kind of a U-shaped ridgeline and it kind of goes like this all the way around. And so with that as kind of a reference, what we can see here is that topography or the aspect is is uh, is what the model is really picking out, and so these west northwest faces are where we're seeing the higher probabilities of spodic morphology popping out. And so then we try and look at what the model is thinking, and so this is just kind of um, this diagram kind of shows you which variables the model is relying on the most. And what we see at the top here 
These four variables, eastness, or northwestness and eastness, are measures of topography across certain, are measures of aspect across certain um, axes. So eastness would be east versus west, and northwestness would be northwest versus southeast. And an MIR is a mid infrared band, which you think is picking out um, vegetation signatures, so probably uh, some of the current conifer that still exists. And then convergence is more of a look at the curvature of the landscape. So high convergence would be a more concave site where, where, um, where moisture would be flowing onto, whereas low convergence would be a more convex site. And so one thing I decided to do is run another um, model just for the topography variables to see how similar it is. And if we look back and forth, so on the left, we have just using topography variables, variables running the same model. We see that it covers a lot of variation that um, that original model that I showed you, where we used all the variables, the topography variables and the remote sensing. And we look down at the bottom when we try we try and cor correlate that to the witness trees. Both are statistically significant um, indicators of where we see red spruce and hemlock in the witness tree database. So again, both of these are tying things back to, we're able to tie these back to the witness trees, but it, but when we add that remote sensing variable, which is picking up some of the current information on where conifer are, it actually strengthens the prediction. Um, so another way you can look inside of the random forest model that we ran is actually just build one individual classification tree. So random forest runs a lot of, a lot of these classification trees and then kind of summarizes them back together. And so I want to look at what was going on. And what we see is the first and most important break is an aspect variable. Um, and so just to kind of show you guys how to read these type of um, plots. So the first break, so we have is if we go to the left, it says it's less than um, negative 0.144. And so that means that it tends towards away from northwest. So we're looking at more towards southeast. And when we go to the right, this is actually means that we're that it's favoring um, more northwest facing aspects, and so if we follow this down, we see that um, if we go, we get to this next break, and it's east versus west, and so we go to the lower values when we follow this left branch, and that means that we're it's actually we're going more towards west facing aspects, and we go down here and we have topographic wetness index. And so lower values of topographic wetness index, we go to this, this, uh, this leaf down here. And so these darker values, this darker um, part of the plot here means that represents areas with spotic morphology. So at each of these leaves, the more dark, um, the more darkness you see in these, uh, in these plots means that there's more spotic morphology in those nodes. And so what, what we can say, when we, especially when we look at this, most of the plots, uh, most of the um, sites uh, fell into this boat right here with high spotic morphology, uh, with more spotic morphology. So to summarize all this, we can say that northwest to west facing sites with mid to low slope positions and less runoff, runoff accumulation and lower mid infrared pixel values, this is summarizing this kind of whole tree plot, have a higher probability of spotic morphology. Um, and we'll talk some more about that. And so now what I want to do is talk about some of the new plot data and some of the associated lab data that I, that I collected last summer and kind of relate that back to this, this greater, um, bigger spatial model we created with um, the NRCS data, the, the 330 field profiles. Um, so again, we had a set of variables to work with. We kind of picked, and, uh, picked I picked some of the uh, what from that initial model seemed like more uh, applicable variables from the, from a digital elevation model. And we looked at some aspect slope and slope observations from the actual plots. Then we looked at some of the plot data um, using kind of those iron aluminum peaks that we showed you. So the area under those peak curves. So we, we I went through and measured that for all the all the, the plots we went to as kind of a, a metric for positivization. And we also looked at overrides in depth, translocated organic matter, and then also um, looking at conifer in importance in those plots. So looking at how, how dominant conifer is relative to hardwoods in those plots and trying to compare that all together. So one of the first questions I had was, 
if we look at the lab data, what is our what is our spodic intensity measure that was that was collected all those plots? What does it mean? How does it relate to the lab data? And so right here we have graphs of the aluminum peak, the iron peak, the organic matter peak, and O horizon depth. And we see they all have significant correlations, not super strong correlations. So they're all kind of related to the spodic intensity measure um, at, at the plots that I did last summer. And, but, but actually O horizon and iron were the most correlated. And those are indeed the most visual thing that you see in profile. And so I kind of went further with it and said, well, how about we combine these different metrics of, uh, when, of what we see in the soil profile and compare that to um, the spodic intensity index. And what I, what I kind of came to is that actually when we combine everything, so aluminum, iron, organic matter, and kind of a rescaled O-horizon um, variable, that seems to have the most consistent kind of positive trend with the spodic intensity values. So that probably is our best representation, so kind of a laboratory analog of that qualitative index that, we, that we're using to kind of summarize spodic intensity. Um, so then I decided, okay, well, I'm going to model that and see if the model that we get with that comes out to something similar to the, um, with, well, actually, this is the spodic intensity data. So we remodeled it with the new plots to see if it was consistent with, with, the, um, with the original data set, the 330 pedons. What we see here is kind of a real simple uh, classification tree model. And this is a little different variable nomenclature, but this is west versus east. So this is an aspect variable. And so we see that that west aspects, if we go down this, um, the tree to the, if we go down this way, west aspects have higher spodic intensity values. And so we move down to here, and we have conifer importance being the next most important variable in distinguishing. So on extreme west-facing aspects with, con with high conifer um, importance, we had um, the, high, the, the strongest expression of spodic morphology. And we are able to explain almost all the variation in this um, subset of, of plots. So it's, this is all kind of supporting that same um, the same structure in the data, aspect driven. Um, and so this is um, so this is doing that same thing with the lab data, where we have the aluminum, iron, organic matter, and horizon kind of um, variable that we think is closest related to spodic intensity. Once again, we see that it's aspect dominated with the west versus east variable, uh, representing three of the four splits here. Um, so then we actually moved up the plots on sheet mounts. So now we're moving kind of into a different physiographic area. So we're up, we're, we're up higher, slightly different geology. And it, the interesting thing we saw up there is that the relationships changed. And so we have, this is a, a variable that represents the contributing area um, that flows on any site. So when you're in a watershed, like how much of the watershed is above you. Um, but if I were to summarize this, this, this particular decision tree, basically at the ridge tops, you have the highest photic um, expression. And then as you move down a little bit, you start getting some aspect controls again. Once you start getting in the same elevation ranges as when you're down in the um, green, upper green viral watershed. And again, we were able to represent a lot of the variation in this, um, in this kind of photic aggregate variable. Um, and so then on the, I, was, I was letting my mind wander, and it's like, well, yeah, so we need to go back and look at these the aluminum and the iron to see what's going on and see if there's different controls on those. Again, we see aspects controlling those along with kind of where you're at the slope. So basically, western aspects, low to mid-slope positions, explains most of where you're um, uh, spotted aluminum and iron um, translocation occurs in soils. And so then again, we looked at sheet mountain because it seemed like there's a different set of controls going on up in sheet mountain. And we got a similar thing. Um, actually, the most important variable for aluminum was the conifer importance, which makes sense. That's, that's kind of our overall hypothesis. And really, sheet mountain has a lot, has come back with a lot more conifer than some of the areas down lower, like the Greenbrier watershed. And this probably also result is a result of you know, the, the conifer-dominated ridgelines. They're, they're still conifer-dominated up there. And then iron was a little bit different, but we could still summarize all this data by saying that on Cheat Mountain, you have higher, more, more expression of spodic morphology on top of the ridgelines, um, 
which, which is kind of a different relationship from what we see down in Greenbrier. Um, and so kind of just thinking about aspect of Lomar, I wanted, I wanted to visualize it a little differently. So we have aspect on your x-axis for both aluminum and iron up here. And we see we have this peak right around west to northwest. We have one outlier that's kind of southwest with aluminum, which is kind of a weird plot. That's actually a plantation plot, so I'm, it's a little, little bit of an oddball. And the same thing going on with iron. So we can kind of see that in box plots where west and northwest we have a little, um, we have higher, higher aluminum iron peaks. And then we have this outlier in, in the southwest facing plantation plot, which is an oddball. So then, okay, let's go back and see how that compares to what the witness tree paper um, from, from Thomas Van Gundy et al. I mean, um, and Dr. Wrench was on that paper too. Um, what we see is, so in these areas, the, the um, southern High Allegheny Mountain uh, part of Monongahela National Forest and the northern High Allegheny Mountains, these are two areas where our plot locations were located, are showing northwest and kind of west um, were favored by, um, by spruce. So this is consistent with what they were finding in, in their analysis. And then we look at kind of the relative elevations where they're finding spruce versus non-spruce points. So these, the dark um, bars are the spruce and the light bars are the non-spruce witness tree points. And so we, in the higher areas, which is Sam here, um, the ridge lines are being dominated or basically favored by spruce, but then if you go lower, that, that relationship changes and kind of lower sites become more favored by spruce. Um, and so these kind of, this kind of seems, all this structure kind of seems consistent with a lot of the um, data we're seeing related to the iron and aluminum um, and different um, spotic soil properties. And so by looking at kind of trying to process what they found in that paper and the results that I found, kind of came up with this, this general kind of schema for how to explain it so that we have this elevation gradient, right? We go, the lowest spruce that they found in the witness tree paper was about 1670 feet. Um, and then we kind of go up to our highest elevation, you know, 4500 plus. And so that's where spruce are most dominant. We find them, they dominate the ridge lines. And if you go a little lower, you start getting small aspect influences. Then you get below 4,000 feet, aspect becomes more important because it's giving a colder climate niche for the spruce, which favors them, keeps things, keeps things more moist. And you go a little bit lower, and that aspect effect is even stronger. Um, and then you get down to the lowest, the lowest points where it was found in the Windows Tree database. And I think it's a cold air drainage effect. It's only found in, in narrow valleys um, where they're kind of, the spruce would be sheltered and they're probably getting cold air drainage. And so it's creating a microclimate. At least that's my, my theory. And, and so we look at, this is the Landsat Geo cover imagery we used. And the blue highlights areas that are dominated in spruce and conifer. And I think it's, it's giving us hints of the same theory. So we're up here in this part of um, the image, this cheap mountain. And we see kind of the higher parts of the ridge lines. We get these blue returns to represent the spruce. And over here in the upper green briar, and so we see it's kind of on some of the on some of the west facing aspects, and then follows some of these some of these narrow canyons down at the very bottom. Um, so this all kind of seems consistent in my um, from what I've been able to glean. Um, so now, well, how does that how does the current conifer relate to all this? So if we think that aluminum and iron represent something in the past, then we really wouldn't expect to see strong, maybe a weak trends, but a lot of noise in the data. And that is indeed what we see. So this aluminum is shown up here in the top, the top rows of graphs. We see a weak correlation, but significant between aluminum and conifer importance up here on the upper left. But other than that, it's, it's, a, it's a bit noisy. So then we say, well, O horizons are supposed to respond quickly. So we should still see a, high, a pretty strong correlation between O horizons and the current conifer importance. And when we look at when we look at the new plots, we see pretty strong correlations between O horizons and conifer importance um, at our plots. In fact, those were the strongest relationships just looking at things from a bivariate sense in the whole data set. So this is also consistent with 
when we bring when we bring kind of classic soil science and pedology is what we call it, um, we bring that knowledge into play here. And so one thing that you might have noticed on that last slide is that that relationship wasn't as strong in the Greenbrier watershed between O horizons and conifer points. And I think there's just I think there's some kind of fire influence going on there. And that was actually where we saw most of the charcoal in our soil profiles. And so if we just look at sites where we didn't see um, charcoal, we start to see a little better positive relationship. Although here's that oddball plantation site again. It's kind of popping up there as a, an older Norway spruce plantation site. Um, so kind of just revisiting some of the main variables that we were, we were looking at. So thinking about conifer importance versus O-horizon depth, we have a super strong relationship, which we kind of expect, because we expect O-horizons to adjust to the forest change quicker. Aluminum, we do see a trend, but it's, it's, it's relatively noisy. Iron, we really we, we don't really see a trend if we just look at the bivariate um, relationship here. Um, and so this all kind of fits with the time scales of, of these different processes that are associated with positivization. And I think kind of supports the theory that, especially for aluminum, we can use that to really look at the specific dominance of conifer in the, the pre-harvest forests. And so, and also by looking at kind of what photic intensity really means, we know that it, it, it represents some of what the aluminum and iron translocation um, parts of puzzleization, but it also is combining some of the more dynamic, um, more dynamic soil properties like O-horizons. And so, so when we think about that and why it's that photic intensity um, is correlated with witness trees, it's probably probably has to do with the aluminum and iron component, um, kind of that's driving some of the the variation in that in our observations of spotic morphology. But we could probably do better is what I think if we, um, if we model it with aluminum. And that's part of kind of some of the future work that we're going to be doing. Because I, I don't quite have all the lab data done from our, our plots last summer. And so kind of to resummarize thoughts about the historic spruce distribution, I think it's mostly climate, microclimate related. Um, and that also is, is a driver in positivization. So they're kind of they kind of co have co-evolved, um, and we see that in aspect and topography controls. And there's some more noise in the data set that I think we can tease out that's based on morphology and chemistry variation that's related to that, um, and we'll be working with that some more. And the other question that's kind of come up um, within all this is depositalization. So what what do we, what does it mean? How 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 might it be? Um, expressed in what we're seeing out there right now, and um, just kind of some visuals on, on what I think we're seeing is that we lose, so we're, so we're looking at a current conifer site, a, a conifer site that we know has been burned, and then a hardwood site that all have, that all have kind of this reddening and um, um, kind of that subsurface spotic morphology. <coughs> What we see is we've lost we've lost the O horizon, and you could argue, but probably lost um, the the uh, organic enrichment in the subsurface, and the E horizon has kind of been um, it's kind of been a you can't see it as well now. There's organic matter that's kind of coating it and it's disguising it, so to speak. And so, and so we go down and say, well, all right, so how does that compare with what we modeled? So they all have high probabilities from that spatial model we, um, that, I, that I created. And they all, and both of these, these two I have lab data for, have relatively high uh, aluminum and iron peaks. So, so depositalization um, is affecting these more dynamic soil properties. So it's more how organic carbon is existing in the system. That's, that's what, on this time frame, that's the main thing that depositalization is going to affect, I think, is a take-home message. Um, so some more conclusions. So we've been able to link historic spruce populations via the witness tree database to, to spotic soil characteristics, um, both controlled by cooler and more moist local climates. And we're pretty confident that we'll be able to find an even 
more specific aluminum to conifer importance relationships. So really being able at a site specific level to say if we have X for our aluminum peak curve in the soils, we should be able to relate that pretty specifically to what the conifer dominance used to be at that location um, before before everything was harvested. Um, so thinking about soil organic matter. So kind of based on these results, if we think about a site like that soil profile I showed you in the depotulization slide, that basically has no horizon right now, um, I think we can pretty safely say that if we restore that to a conifer dominated site, we'll be able to add um, probably 9 to 20 centimeters of O horizon to that site. And we're kind of look, um, we'll be looking more at the data to see how if we can create a more spatially complete map of what kind of the carbon losses have been historically from, from these shifts in the system. Um, but there's definitely a significant potential for carbon sequestration in these, in these systems where depositalization has occurred. Um, so for more future work, future thoughts, we're going to finish our lab analysis. And so we're going to model mainly aluminum is what I, is what I want to model spatially and then retest that against the Witness 2 database. I think the results are going to be even better, but we'll just have to see. Um, might try and integrate some different um, spatial climate surfaces, so spatial climate maps, to try and get a better model. Um, then we want to also do kind of similar stuff with historic soil organic carbon stocks by using that aluminum as a surrogate for how strong um, that might have been in the past. And we've also got some charcoal samples out to, to date, and so we think we can actually come up with some rates of overrising and accrual based on kind of that, that burn off is kind of an initial starting point, and then we look at how much organic matter is accumulated on top of that, um, which should give us some real interesting, very specific data on how fast we can get carbon back in the system if we restore. Um, also looking at trying to actually map some of those states within those state transition models explicitly. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty possible using a couple different types of imagery or candidates, including the lines that you cover and some of that CIR stuff and also looking at some of the current forest inventories. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of literature out, out, there, out there about ectomycorrhizal adaptations in these kind of systems, and I think that's going to relate a lot to especially northern flying squirrel habitat, as I've kind of learned about it slowly from especially Shane, and, and I, think, uh, I think a lot of the food sources might be related to that from northern flying squirrel, but I won't venture too far into that because it's outside of my domain of, uh, of expertise. Um, we also are working with Dr. Tom Saladega from Concord University, and he's doing dendrochronology on all the tree cores we extracted at our at our plots. And so um, he's great, and he's he's got them all cross dated. He's just about finished with all of them. He's going to be looking at trying to rec recreate some real specific climate histories and looking at release events that we think will be associated and timed with um, some of the disturbance in these systems. We've already got one 270-year-old spruce who we were able to pretty much match up with, I think, about 1880, so right, right when things were going on there. Um, and as just a little teaser to that work that he's doing, right now we have five red, red spruce cores that predate 1830, the oldest of which is, um, was dated back to around 1670. So that's going to be super cool. Um, so big long list of references. Let me know if you want to. If you want them, um, and that's it. So I don't know if we have any time for questions. Okay. Uh, this is Sean. Uh, yep. and we have some online questions if there's time. Yeah, Sean, if we could, that, that'd be fine. It, it, it'll just push us back a couple of minutes on the next presentation, if that's okay. It's your call. Yeah, why don't we do that? Go, go ahead. All right, third question. Uh, with climate change and a warmer climate, is it wise to restore spruce? Did red spruce become dominant historically under a cooler climate? And does spruce restoration work have a higher risk of failure due to global warming climate shift? 
So, yeah, so the, the question is, is, is it wise to restore red spruce with a warming climate? And it's an interesting question because <laughs> there's a lot of feedback loops in there. Um, I, so we're thinking about perspective on this question. We're working, th this, this study area, this, the swath that, that where we sampled last summer is an ecotone. It's, and it's an ecotone between temperate hardwood forests and more of a boreal, uh, a boreal conifer kind of system. And one of the interesting differences when you look at kind of review literature on these two systems is that in that conifer boreal system, you just have huge amounts of carbon in the soil. And so what I think is that climate change has already shifted the ecotone a little bit a little bit higher, but not high enough that we shouldn't restore. And the other thing is if we don't restore and try and put some of that carbon back away, so this, is, this is a large amount of carbon, and that's one of the things that we're going to, will be the end result of this work is, is trying to clarify what those numbers are and what implication that has in a broader global sense. I think it's significant, and I think if we don't do it, then we're just kind of saying, well, we put all this carbon in the atmosphere in the past, and we're just going to leave it there. And I think we still have the chance to put a good portion of it back. Maybe we won't be able to restore it in the full historic extent of red spruce, but we can definitely do a lot more than, than, than what, what's on the ground right now. Okay, Travis, there's, there's another question here. It's a quick one. Uh, what are the soil textures in these five horizons? Um, we range from silty coelum all the way to, to loamy sand. Um, just depends on what, what geology you're in, but we do have kind of the the heavier textures in some of the spotocells um, down in the down the green briar, which which uh, which Skip talked about in an earlier lecture. But then you go up into some of the sandstones on the ridge tops, and you get into sandier, more classic spotocells. That's all for online questions. Okay. Maybe we should let that one stew, I think, yeah. and move on and we get a just good discussion topic there, for yeah. sure. We can, we can come back to that at the end of the uh, – we're actually going to have a forum here after the last presentation, Sean. Um, and I know we're running a couple minutes behind. I'm going to put you on, on uh, mute just for a couple minutes while I get the uh, next presentation queued. Uh, would that be okay, Sean?